morning, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. You guys, uh, you haven't weighed yourself, I hope. Uh, I, I refuse to do that after Thanksgiving and the holidays. Um, we just, like, I had an awesome Thanksgiving. Like, my kids, my kids were home. We, uh, my parents were in town. My in-laws were in town. It was just a, a great time. And uh, I, I love everything about Thanksgiving. I love, I love the um, time with family. I love napping. I love, I love football games. I love napping. Um, <laughs> but I especially love the food. And uh, people, I don't know if you noticed this, like if you maybe, if you just only do Thanksgiving with your immediate family, you may not notice this, but like this is a real deal. Like people get ferociously opinionated about what sides need to be at Thanksgiving dinner. You know, like you go to somebody else's house and they don't have like a corn casserole and you're like poof, flipping tables, right? I mean, it's just like people are serious about like, if you don't have yams, what the heck is this, right? Like we're not, this isn't, you can't even call this Thanksgiving. Well, you can, but like people get very opinionated about it. And I always go into, I go, always go into Thanksgiving. But my problem is, is that I, I love all of the sides. I don't really I don't care as long as there's like turkey and mashed potatoes, that's really the mainstay. But I go in every single time thinking like, Justin, don't do, don't eat too much. Like, don't do what you did last year. Last year you hurt, you were in pain. You remember this pain, Justin, like don't do it. And then, um, so I go in with a plan and my plan, and maybe you can relate to this if you're like a type A personality like me, I kind of treat my plate like a, like a clock, right? With like, like numbers on the clock. And so I go in, you, you, you're, you, those of you who know, you, you're all like, yeah, I'm already on it, right? The rest of you are like, what are you even talking about? I just like, pff, pff, pff. and then you just eat it, right? Like, but if you, those of you who aren't serial murderers, you like, you, you like to have things like separated. And so you go in, you're like, all right, I got turkey and then mashed potatoes. That takes up a couple numbers because I like my mashed potatoes because I'm Irish. And, um, and so you put that and then you, then you put in some sweet potato casserole because that's sweet. And then some cranberry sauce, little green beans because I'm healthy. And then, um, and then the clock's full. The clock's full. And I'm like, I, but, I, but I want the corn casserole. And so I'm like, oh, okay, okay. In the corn casserole, can I find a center area for that? And then um, I try not to overlap my foods. Those of you who know me, like I don't like my foods to touch because they're not supposed to. They're supposed to be kind of separated. And so, but then comes gravy time. Gravy time ruins everything, right? Because I try my best. And those of you who know, you know, like I try my best to keep the gravy in the pond that I've created in my mashed potatoes. I, I fortify the walls. I make them tall so that there's, there, the, the dam will not break. But then I, I just want more gravy. And so I just keep putting more gravy. And it always happens that all of a sudden in my overzealousness to get more gravy and gravy, the dam breaks, the flood happens, and everything just touches. And I, at some point, I have to just embrace the mess that is Thanksgiving dinner. Like, and um, I think about this, like it's kind, of, it's kind of how life is, isn't it? Like we would love to experience life separately in its own little compartments and neat and tidy, and, but everything always touches. It's like Thanksgiving dinner. Like we would love for our home life to, to not, like the problems at work wouldn't, wouldn't leak over and, and touch our home life and taint it. We, we would love for, for our finances to just stay far away from our marriage, right? Like if, it, if that could just not play into our relationship and our marriage relationship, that'd be great. We'd love if like, if our present circumstances were unaffected by the gravy of our past, right? But it just always seems to just bleh onto what we're currently dealing with. The reality is, is that like we, we don't get to experience life like that uh, as much as we'd like to. We don't get to experience the good parts of life and not the bad parts of life and not have them touch because they always do. Life is a lot like a heaping Thanksgiving dinner plate. You have the good and the bad and they're always touching. Like you can get really bad news on a really good day. And you can get really good news on a really bad day and you don't get to experience them separately. You experience them together. They touch always. Luke chapter six, verse 45. I want to read it for you in the Passion Translation. 
He says, for the overflow of what has been stored in your heart will be seen by your fruit and will be heard in your words. It's this reality that like um, the things that are stored up on the inside of us come outside of us. And sometimes they come out in our words and other times they come out in our actions or the fruits of our life. And so we're in a sermon series that we started last week talking about words. And the message title of the message today is this, Louder Than Words. And what we know to be true, maybe not in our own life, but we know to be tr true in the lives of other people that, in, that kind of end up spilling over and overflowing into our life, is that actions speak louder than words. And, and I, can, I can say, every Thanksgiving, I can say with my mouth that I'm going to be good. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to eat like I did last year, right? I, I can say that all day long, but as I'm going down and, I'm, and, I'm, and I have more food that I put onto my plate and then into my mouth, my, my actions speak louder than my words. And so today we're going to look at a miraculous story of um, Jesus with some lepers in Luke chapter 17, and a watch how Jesus actually says and thinks that like actions speak louder than words. And so let's work down through this story in Luke 17, if you've got your Bible. Um, we're just going to start in verse 11 and kind of make our way down through it. It says this, now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And he meets some guys. It says this, as he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him and they stood at a distance. Now pause. These 10 men had leprosy. I don't expect you to necessarily know or to understand what leprosy is um, in that like it's for the most part completely you know, eradicated from our society. But it, back then, and for many, many, many generations, it was a horrific disease. It was a disease a lot like the gravy that touches all the food on your plate. Like it just, it affected everything. It wasn't just like, yeah, I've got a little bit of heart problem. Yeah, I got this, or I got some high blood pressure. I, like, it was something that affected every part of your life. It touched the individual physically, first and foremost. That's how you knew you had it. It was an infection. And sometimes you wouldn't even know you, you were infected for like a few years after the infection. And so you would end up infecting other people without even knowing that you, and you yourself were infected, which is how it was so difficult to kind of keep this thing under wraps. But it, it was known for uh, all of a sudden, like your extremities especially would become numb and then they would, they would kind of get deformed. They would die and, and many times different parts, fingers would, would fall off. It was horrific. I mean, it was like a, it was a horrible, horrible way to die. You would, it was a slow, slow, slow death. But it affected them physically, and that was the worst part of, of leprosy. It also affected them religiously. When I say religiously, I mean like uh, in kind of like, they couldn't come to church if they wanted to. Like they were sh literally shunned from being able to come to temple to be around the, the people of God. And so... They were required to keep their distance and they had to make their, their, their themselves known. So like if they would come into town and they would like enter into the parking lot or whatever and they would see other people, they would have to let themselves be known by literally yelling the word unclean. Like unclean, unclean, un what, a, what a horrible thing. You know what I mean? Like it's like every, everything that you're ashamed of that you have on the inside of you, you have to now let everybody know. It's like, think about the thing that you're most ashamed of, and that's the thing that you just got to yell as soon as you come into contact with everyone, right? Like, that thing is, and everybody looks, and they're, oh, gosh, they guard their children and pull them away and tell them, yeah, don't come on, get closer, right? Because lepers were required by religious law to keep their distance and to, and to not even come near people that, that were clean, and that was the hard part, is that they weren't just considered sick, they were considered altogether unclean, religiously speaking. It also touched them socially. This was probably the saddest part. They had to isolate themselves from everyone, including their own wives and children. Like, you couldn't be around even your loved ones because you could get them sick and then, then they would have to segregate and isolate themselves from the rest of society. 
And so they would, they would begin to associate only with other lepers. That was the only thing you could hang out with. I mean, you just hang out with people that had the same disease. You, you, you hung out with them, and it was their common condition that brought these 10 guys together. And what we know to be true is that misery loves company. Right? So you're just like, man, I'm, I can't be around other people, so I'm going to be around other people who can't be around other people. They're going to be my people. And so they're, they're certainly, they, they shared this in this group of 10 guys. Maybe we could even call them their own small leper colony. And what's hard to hear, and I just find to be true, is that the very same thing happens in our own lives. It's not that like we all share uh, a disease as obvious as limbs falling off of ourselves, but like we tend to congregate together based upon shared misery, um, or at least a shared condition, because there's safety in com commonality, there's safety in community, and so they would hang out, and the only thing that they had in common was that they had the same misery, the same dysfunction, the same, that was it. There was nothing really else about them that they would hang out with and find themselves friends with each other around. Like if you're, think about it this way, like if we bring this into like current day, like obviously we don't have leprosy and all of that, but I think like if you find yourself surrounded by people who gossip, it may actually say something more about you. Like if you find yourself around people who are critical and always complaining, like you should probably take a good look in the mirror. Because, because people who, who don't listen to gossip and who don't want to be a part of that actually find themselves repelled from people who gossip. So you're like, I just don't even want to be around that. And I'm just not comfortable with it, right? So like people who are positive, people that like are thankful and like and have gratitude, like, like ingrained on the inside of them are repelled by and will repel people who are critical and complaining. Like it just don't have much to talk about. Why? I mean, because like, I like to rant about things and you don't. And so we just really don't have much of a commonality here because there's safety and commonality. Even if it's common dysfunction, we can find that like we're drawn together based upon who we don't like or who we hate rather than, rather than the other things. And so these 10 guys, they're, they're gathered together. They found community in their common disorder. In verse 12, it's interesting. It says they, they stood at a distance because they know, they know their lane, all 10 of them. And they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, master, have pity on us. They're all yelling to Jesus. Jesus, master, have pity on us. I think it's really interesting that like, they don't ask to be healed of leprosy. They plead for pity. They're like, hey, we are lepers. Um, could, you, could you heal us of the thing that we're... That we're we don't want to be here. We don't want to be doing this thing. But they're just like, would you ha please have pity on us? Master, Jesus, have pity on us. Be because sometimes when you are overwhelmed with the situations and circumstances in your life, you can have a really hard time seeing outside of your circumstance. I don't know if you've ever been there before where you're like, man, I, I want to believe that there's a light at the end of this tunnel. All I see is darkness. All I see is this tunnel. I don't actually know what it looks like on the other side of my circumstance. And so the best you can yell is what these guys kind of did, which is like, help. I don't even know what we're just, can you fix this, me, the things? We, we're a mess. We're, we can't even come over close to you. Could you just make us better? Have pity on us. Do something, please. Anything would help us. And it's interesting because like, I don't see Jesus taking issue with that. Like, I don't, I don't think that he dismisses us because we are un, unable to dream outside of our dysfunction. He doesn't sit there with his arms crossed and be like, well, what exactly would you like me to do? They're like, just help us. Like, we're broken. We need fixing. I don't exactly know what you can do. I'm just open. Jesus, master, have pity on us. Um, and what we find out in our own lives is this, like when we arrive at the end of ourselves, it's always the beginning of God. And sometimes it sounds like, help. I don't know what this looks like. 
I mean, literally, when I came to Jesus, I was like, I don't even know what this means. I'll pray a prayer. What I have no clue. I just know that I want to have a, a relationship with the creator of the universe. I want what this person has in my life. So can, can you help me? Can you, how do I get that? I don't, I don't know the right thing to do, the right things to say. I don't know if there's an, a special magic spell, an incantation I need to speak. Like, I just, just please help me. I'm broken and I need help. And this is kind of where these, where these guys are at. They're they're at the end of themselves. Verse 14, when Jesus saw them, he says to them, go show yourselves to the priests. And pause. This is such a weird command. It's odd. I'm sure it was odd to them. I think it's, it's probably even more odd to us because it sounds a lot like he should say, like, go see a doctor or go, go to a dermatologist, right? Like, I know they take six months to get in. You might want to make a call and get your primary care physician to make it. I mean, like, you know what I mean? Like, you think that that would be, he's like, no, go, go show yourself to the priests. And what we, we may not be aware of is that, like, in addition to spiritual leadership, the, the Jewish priest Part of his task is, as a priest was to examine skin lesions and um, sores. He would um, have to look at the color of the hair that was growing out of the sore. If it was white or black, it made a difference. Uh, you'd have to, is it, is it swollen? Is it scabby? Is it pussy? Right? Like, is it, uh, and it would have to ceremonial clean clean the sores. I'm just being honest with you. Can I just say this completely, completely honestly? I am so glad that the present day pastor does not have that responsibility because I would not feel called to be your pastor. I'd be like, you need to go to a dermatologist. That is like, that would be disgusting. I'd be like, huh, you go. Please be free. Like, I don't need to see it. No, but pastor, I got this weird. I'm like, ah, no, <laughs> I'm all good. I'm all good. I'm all good. Um, but back in the day, this is, this is what the, the task of a priest it would, it was his responsibility. And he would have to determine and de declare if somebody was clean or unclean as a leper based upon inspection of the sores. <laughs> they were doing good and hairs coloring, um, you can read it for yourself. It's disgusting. There's a, but here's, here's the problem here in this story. And maybe you noticed it. The problem in the story is that Jesus didn't heal them yet. Like he's like, they're like, master, have pity on us. And he's like, go show yourself to the priest. But Jesus hadn't healed them yet. So this command from Jesus must have been incredibly confusing. I mean, if you think about it, like you got 10, 10 friends and, and they're like, Master, have pity. And he's like, go show yourself to the priest. And they're like, Frank, this like, do I look good? Is that everything good? No, man, you still, you smell. Like, no, you are not doing good. And you're like, okay, well, like, Jim, like how many fingers am I holding up? You know what I mean? Like, not all of them. You know what I mean? Like, like, there's this reality, that was a magic trick, by the way. Um, there's this reality that, like, what they're experiencing is not anywhere close to what Jesus commands them to go do. I, I, I want you to understand that the faith that it would have taken for these 10 guys to respond to Jesus and to, to go and to show although they had no reason to go and nothing to show. They're like, go where and who and what? I'm still, still I, I don't know, why, what, what am I supposed to go show the priest? You haven't healed me yet. And I want you to finish verse 14. It says in verse 14, and this is so key. And as they went, they were cleansed. You can't get around this. Like, notice how it happened. They were healed as they went. And, and, the, 
That seems to be how God likes to work. This is the maddening part of following Jesus, folks. Like this is the maddening part of trying to figure out what faith looks like as I try to follow Jesus. I wrote it in your notes like this, like sometimes obedience requires action before understanding. Sometimes obedience requires action before understanding. The problem with me, and maybe I can speak for you, is like, I want God to just lay it all out ahead of time. I want to, I want to see the full plan. I want to see how all of the dots connect. I want to, I want to see the, I want, how much I mean, all the, I want to see everything. I want to show me, show me all the stuff before I'm willing to take a step, before I'm willing to speak it out, before I'm willing to start walking in that direction. I need to know what the plan is, Jesus. However, if you follow Jesus for any length of time, you realize that's just not how he works. It's so frustrating. I wish he would just get in line, right? And just do what I'm asking him to do. Because many times God requires us to attach our faith to his word before we begin to see his word work. Let me say that again. Many times God requires us to attach our faith to his word before we begin to see his word work. It's really, it's, it's frustrating because Faith is not seeing the results and then believing, uh, I believe you can do that, Lord. No, like faith demands that we believe God before we see the results. Faith demands that we believe God before we see the results. And what's highly uncomfortable about this story of this healing is that I tend to expect that God is always going to work in the instantaneous and the extraordinary. But God tells them to walk out their obedience. And don't miss this. It was their obedience that preceded the miraculous. They had to decide, like, I don't feel better. You don't smell better. You don't look better. But Jesus says to go and show, even though we have no reason to go here and no thing to show here. But I'm going to walk in obedience to it before I see the results of it. Like we have to walk into and attach our faith to his word before we get to see his word work. It's confusing at best. And the the cool thing, it says, and they were healed as they went as they went. So they, I don't know how long they started walking in the direction to go show the priest, but somewhere along the way, I don't know if they're like, man, we're like ready to knock on the door of the priest. I don't, I have no idea. They're just like, is something going to happen here? Like we're, we're going to look like fools going up to a priest. We're going to knock on the door. I still, you smell, you don't like what's going to happen. And they're somewhere along the way. It says, as they went, they were healed. Can I just encourage you that God will often ask you to do something that seems completely counterintuitive? In fact, he, he does that all the time. He does this in other ways, like, like think about it this way, like um, he calls us to, to tithe on the front end, even when we fear that we won't have enough on the back end. He's like, well, you, you trust me, but yeah, but I don't know how this is going to, because it seems like less. And it's not going to work unless I, and he's like, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to walk in obedience on the front end and trust me that I'm going to be your provider on the back end. Like that is counterintuitive. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't, you talk to any like, like financial advisor and like, that's like not a good idea. You shouldn't do that. He, not only with tithing, like think about this, like he calls us to forgive. Um, even though we know that that idiot doesn't deserve it right? You know that. Like, that's crazy. Forgive them? Why? So they can do more stupid? Like, are you kidding me? Like, no, that's completely counterintuitive to forgive someone when we don't necessarily know how all that's going to play out. And they certainly don't deserve it. He calls us to do things like seek out community, friendships, even though isolation seems so much safer. Like, I mean, I don't want to get hurt again. I got like 
I got church hurt. I got friend hurt. Like, I'm just, I think it's better if I just keep some distance here from people. He says things like, don't worry. I'm like, I, pretty much worry is the only thing I can do right now. Like, I, I'm, I'm trying to control this thing. I feel like the only thing I can do, the only control I have is just to, just to worry, to, to perseverate on this, this issue that I'm having. And in this situation, he tells 10 lepers, lepers to, to go and show, even when they have no reason to go and nothing to show. Like, trust me. Faith demands that we believe God before we see the results. Verse 15, he continues. It says, one of them, one, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. Thankfulness is not just an emotion. Thankfulness is a conscious decision. In your notes, I wrote it this way, that thankfulness requires you to make a comeback. Thankfulness requires you to make a comeback. And this is what this one guy out of the 10 decides after he's healed to make a comeback to give thanks to Jesus for healing him. Only one of them. And I want you to notice something. It says that he came back praising God, verse 15, in a loud voice. Here's the interesting thing. You might, you might remember from a few verses before this, like all of them, all 10 of them kept called for pity in a loud voice. But only one of them came back praising God in a loud voice. Both of them were loud voices. Can I just say this to you? And I say this as, as just love and encouragement over you. Your praise better be as loud as your prayer request. I want to say it again. Your praise better be as loud as your prayer request is. Amen? Like your worship better be as loud as your worry was. So many times our, our prayer requests are, oh, Jesus, say, oh, hallelujah, oh, I need the help. Oh, fix me, save me, plead for, plead for mercy. And so many times we're worrying, oh, we're wringing our hands. Oh, Jesus, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to do. Oh, this, 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 my pets' heads are falling off. We got no friends. We got no, like we all these horrible things. And God does and works in the midst of all of those things. And we're silent on the other side of it. And our praise pales in comparison to our prayer requests. Our worship is silent compared to our worry and how loud that was in our life. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 says this. Be cheerful with joy, joyous celebration. Catch these words. In every season of life, let your joy overflow. This, I, this reality is like God, gratitude is choosing to praise God before we see the results. And it's also choosing to give thanks after we've seen the results. There's sometimes I'm like, okay, sometimes I'm just called to praise God, even though it's like I'm in a really bad day. In this season of life, I'd rather not be in, but I'm choosing to, to be cheerful with joyous celebration in this season of life. And God, when you are moving and I am seeing growth and I am bearing fruit, God, I choose to give you thanks in that season of life as well. I choose to let joy overflow on the inside of me, to rejoice, to give back that which you've put in me, to rejoice. The Bible says that like only one of them decides to make this comeback. Only one of them decides to come back in a loud voice and give thanks. Only one of them returns. And it's real easy to look at the other nine and be like, dude, seriously, you missed it. You guys, you stink at life. Like, come on. Like, how ungrateful can you be? Were you busy? What do you got going on? Like, there's some reason why all nine of you, you were, you were lepers, like, in pain, all, I mean, you couldn't just make a, a trip back to, to say thank you? 90% of them didn't make the comeback. And I felt, I felt the Holy Spirit whisper, is it really that different for you? Is it really that different for you? And what I begin to realize is this, like, gratitude is not always natural. Gratitude is not always natural. 
And I'll, I'll just like take it back to our current day. This is my temptation in my family, in my finances, over my health. I can begin to focus on what I did to get me where I am. Well, I take good care. I go to the doctors when my wife makes me. I, uh, you know, I, I budget. We try to live by that. So, you know, I kind of, it's some hard work. We made some, some good investments early on. So that's why we're at where we're at right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, we, we, I try to focus on what I did to get me where I am. And I wonder if the other nine were too busy praising themselves for their own radical obedience, their own daring faith. Can you believe it? My gosh, we were awesome, aren't we? I mean, Jesus was like, go and show. And we're like, oh, I don't even know. Should I do? Well, okay, we're just going to do it. Wow, we are so radical. We should write a book. This is amazing. Like, we are so awesome, aren't we? All nine of us. Where's that other guy? I don't know. He went to go to the side. Who knows? Like, but let's talk about us. Right? Like how we got through our own faith that was just, I mean, we're probably going to get in the Bible. You think we're going to get in the Bible? Oh, absolutely, we're going to make it in the Bible. I hope they say my name. They probably won't. But like, it was so cool. Like, we are, we're absolutely amazing. And they didn't have time because they were talking about their own radical obedience and their own daring faith that they forgot to thank the praise, the, the one who healed them. And this reality is this, that gratitude begins where entitlement ends. Let me say that again. Gratitude begins where entitlement ends. You're like, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, let's think about it in a, in a, in a reverse way. Uh, think about what might have happened if, think about that, if they didn't get healed as they went. Let's say, let's say they just were like, okay, I guess we're going to try and do this. And they, they, they go, and the priest's like, you're still lepers. Get out of here. And they're like, here, here's what I will tell you. I, I, I bet that you would see a greater percentage of them make a comeback. But it'd be different. Like, um, hey, Jesus, remember us? We're the 10. Yeah, we, you were like, we were like, Hey, help us out. Have mercy, pity on us. And, and he's like, you go, go show yourself to the, to the priest. And we did. Just, we wasted our entire day because of you. I don't know if you, you didn't say the prayer right or something. It's like a magic word on the end. I, 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 you screwed it up. Like, could you do us a solid and get it right this time? Because we've been walking all day and I'm not really good on my feet. And like, if you could do it right and, and make it right, that'd be, that'd be really great. Get it right this time, please. Thank you. Gratitude begins where entitlement ends. And so the one comes in verse 16. It says, he threw himself at Jesus' feet. Threw himself. Threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And then it says, and he was a Samaritan. And your notes are written this way. Like complaining grows when we focus on the problem but thankfulness flows when we focus on, on God's presence no matter the problem. And I'm just, I just want to just be in your presence, Jesus. And what's interesting is this, this, this one man who does make the comeback is not only a freshly former leper, but he's also a Samaritan, and Jews did not associate with Samaritans. And so this Samaritan leper... He has a bunch of things going against him. He doesn't feel entitled. Like he just is thinking like, man, did Jesus even know? Like I was a Samaritan with the other nine. These guys are Jews. I totally lucked out. I got the blessing and I got healed. But like, man, I just was in the right place at the right time with the right people. Hallelujah. Like, and he was the only one that made a comeback because gratitude begins where entitlement ends. But he didn't just come back with a thank you card. He threw himself at Jesus' feet. And he turns his blessing into praise. He turns his blessing into praise. And here's, here's, the, here's the hard part. If we fail to turn our blessing into praise, it begins to smell a lot like pride. It starts to smell 
after a few days. You want to stay grateful, thankful? Make sure that your praise is louder than your pride. Amen? Amen? And sometimes it requires words, although it seems like he didn't need much. He didn't even need to say. It says he thanked him, but it doesn't even say what he actually said because he was too busy with his head in the ground and his feet and his face before Jesus' feet. Verse 17. Jesus asked, we're not all 10 cleansed. Where are the other nine? It blows me away. Jesus got a lot going on, right? He's, he's healing people. He's preaching. He's got crowds of people all around. It blows me away that Jesus knew exactly how many lepers he healed. This is a group of unclean guys over there. I don't know. They're like yelling, pity on us, have pity on us. And Jesus is like, go show, go show yourself to the priest. It reminds me that Jesus doesn't heal crowds. He heals people. One at a time is how he heals them. One at a time. And he was actually waiting and he was actually watching to see who would make a comeback. Can I encourage you? Be the one. Be the one. Verse 18. He says, he asks a follow-up question. He says, has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? My question that I leave you with today is this. Is your praise overdue? Like, are you walking in blessings that used to be prayer requests and you haven't made a comeback to turn, your, turn them into praise reports? Like the Bible says, like we are saved by the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony. Have you been muted to the word of your testimony and failed to give praise to God and for that which used to be a prayer request? Is your praise overdue? Have you received what you've asked for in prayer and then convinced yourself that you worked really hard for it? Is your praise overdue? Because when, when you turn your blessing into praise, it actually opens you up for even greater blessing. And this is what happens in this guy's life. I'll leave you with verse 19. He says, then Jesus says to this guy, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. To which you may be thinking, like, I, th I thought he was already made well. I thought that all the guys were made well. I thought they were all. But like, it's interesting that word made well in the Greek is actually the word sozo. Which it means saved. It means healed. It means delivered. It means made whole. So the 10 lepers, all 10 of the lepers, their obedience opened them up for healing, but the one man's comeback made him whole. In your notes, I wrote it this way. The difference between healing and wholeness was the comeback. The difference between healing and wholeness was the comeback. All 10 got healed, but only one was made whole. All 10 got a word from Jesus, but only one of them got an encounter with him. And I want you to see this because I think it's important because sometimes we can think of like praise and worship as like, God is just so needy. He just always needs my, my praise and my worship and all of those different types of things. It's really important for us to see this, that God doesn't ask us to praise him for his good, but rather for our good. He comes back, gives thanks, and it's not just to bring a, a grandizement to Jesus and to, and to God for doing the work, although that, that obviously is, it points to Jesus. But it was actually for his good that he was not only healed, he was made whole. Can I remind you, church, that there is more to life than being healed? God wants to make you whole. So you can walk in healing, but it is just a shadow, a foretaste of the wholeness that God wants to bring into your life. And can I encourage you today, don't stop halfway what God wants to do all the way to make you whole, not just healed. Why don't you stand with me?
Revelation 3.20 says this. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. And I want to give you an opportunity. Maybe, maybe you're in that place right now where you're like, you, you've, you've pled with God for pity from a distance. You've, you, you, you've seen him as, as you've been like at arm's length. Maybe you've even begged for healing at times in your life. But I love this scripture because it's reminding us that like God wants to actually encounter us personally. He says, you come, you open the door, I will come in, into there, and dine with you, and you with me. If you're, if you're ready and you're in that place today, I just want to encourage you to take a moment to um, maybe you pray. Maybe you pray that prayer of just saying, God, I, 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 I've been asking for healing. I've been asking for pity. I've been asking for mercy. I've been asking for forgiveness. But maybe I've stopped short in not asking for everything that you want to, to do in and through me, to make me whole. And so maybe if you're in that place today, I just want to encourage you. I just, like, there's nothing magical about, about this prayer. It is just a heart a heart place of just saying, like, God, I, I, want, I want all that you want to give me. So, Lord, I, I, I choose this day to receive you as my Lord and Savior. Jesus, I thank you that you came, that you died, that you hung on a cross, that you were buried and rose again three days later to give me more and better life. And not just even to bring healing, but to bring wholeness to my life. And so today, I choose to receive that wholeness in its entirety. Lord, have your way in my life. Save me, deliver, deliver me, heal me, and make me whole. Give me all that you want to give me, and we receive it. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And maybe you're here today, and this is what I want to invite you into. As we end with this last song, I want to dare you to be the one. To say, you know what, I've, I've chosen to focus on all the things that are, that are going wrong. I've chosen to say, like, you know, I, I, I just... This, isn't, this didn't happen, or this isn't going right, or, or this, this area of my life, I wish it was different right now. But today, I'm choosing to focus on you, Lord, and to be thankful for that which you've already done in my life, and to maybe even take some of the things that I've taken credit for, that I worked hard, I went to school, I studied, I, I, I managed my money well, I tried this, and I've done that, and I don't do this, and I don't do that, and I do this, and I do and just realize, God, it is but for Jesus Christ. <laughs> I don't even know where I would be. And so I choose to turn my blessing into praise this morning. And maybe today, I just want to encourage you, if you feel led to even just come down here at the front with me, just like put your face down before Jesus. Like, God, I thank you huh, that you saved me, that you healed me that you forgave me, that you made me whole. God, I ask forgiveness for those areas of my life that I've tried to take credit for or, or even felt entitled for at times. And I, I choose to be thankful today, to have a heart of gratitude. I choose to, to lay that down before you, Jesus, to be overwhelmed with that which you've given me that I know that I don't deserve. Let it be a comeback. Lord, we thank you for your goodness in our life. Because without it, we would be nowhere. Have your way in us. In Jesus' name. As we sing today, just encourage you, whatever you feel led to before God, take some time to just make a comeback before him and allow your blessing to be turned into praise.